Hello, dear all, and welcome back to our IVF webinar. It's wonderful to be here on a Friday evening with all of you. And of course, it's amazing to have our special, another special guest with us tonight. This is Dr. Francisco Anaya, and I'm very happy that you are back with us because a long time ago, for me at least, it seems like a long time ago, you've been here before. Uh, you were also presenting a topic, and tonight you are back, and tonight you will talk about endometrium assessment techniques. So welcome back and how are you feeling Dr. Francisco tonight? <laughs> Thank you very much Caroline. Thank you for your help and your patience today <laughs> and I feel very happy to be with you sharing this evening and um, well, we will try to explain some things about endometrium and we will try to to uh, answer all the questions our patients may may have. Uh, of course, uh, as always we will start with your presentation on the topic but mm -hmm. uh, remember that your time will be after the presentation you will be able to ask your questions and you can put those in the chat section and Dr. and I will definitely help you out so don't hesitate we are here and if you don't know this is actually our final uh, webinar before summer break so don't worry we will be back in September uh, but of course you can um, now um, just use this time as uh, we will still have a break. So you won't have a chance to ask your questions on Monday. So don't forget to do this today then. And let me just mention that Dr. Francisco, he is the gynecologist at Vista Hermosa Clinic. Um, we do have many uh, members from Vista Hermosa Clinic and we are also very happy to be cooperating with such an excellent um, team and excellent experts like uh, Dr. Francisco. And uh, I guess, Let's get going with our topic tonight, okay, Dr. Francisco? Okay, perfect. Excellent. Thank you so much. There's, Thank there's you, your Caroline. presentation. Okay. Well, first of all, as Caroline said, I am Francisco Anaya. I'm a gynecologist at the unit of reproduction of Clinica Vista Hermosa in Alicante, Spain. We are part of a group of clinics based in different hospitals in the main cities in Spain. And we have uh, more than 35 years of experience in fertility. As I said before, I would like to thank uh, my IVF answers for giving me the opportunity to share this evening with you and mainly Caroline for her help and patience. Okay, we're going to talk, to talk about endometrial assessment techniques. I would like to say that the human endometrium is a unique tissue in many ways. No other tissue proliferates, differentiates, sloughs over and over again cycle after menstrual cycle for up to 40 years. Endometrium is a hormone-dependent tissue that forms the mucosal lining of the inside of the uterus. It is not only an interface between the internal and external environment of a woman's body, but philosophically speaking, it is the interface to our own existence, as all of us required the endometrium to begin our journey as human beings. This complex transformation is the direct result of the endometrium's multifunctional task. To be receptive to the developing embryo, in cycles with successful fertilization, to, on one hand, allow for the attachment of the blastocyst, and on the other hand, uh, prevent overly aggressive incursion by the invasive trophoblasts, which, sorry for this, it's not charging. Which, which, if not checked, could penetrate and rupture the uterus. And finally, the final function is to shed when there is no implantation. Only to start over again next cycle. No other tissue in our species has the task of radically change its structure, biology, endocrinology, and function in this way repeatedly. 
It is very important the fact that endometrial function is not only allowing embryo implantation, but also does it with selectivity. If not, any embryo entering the uterine cavity would implant, resulting in a pregnancy, whatever the quality of the embryo or the state of the woman. It is just this complex tissue that has the selective potential, which in turn allows the development of a competent embryo when the woman is most able to support a successful pregnancy. I am going to introduce you a few ideas about how human endometrium is. Endometrium consists of two basic layers, stratum basalis, which lays adjacent to myometrium, is stratum functionalis. The stratum functionalis is further divided into stratum compactum, containing mostly stroma, and stratum spongiosum, consisting mostly of glands, small amounts of stroma, and this interstitial tissue. This functionalis stratum is the most important endometrial part of the embryo attachment. Endometrial proliferation, secretion, and degeneration occurs in this stratum functionalis. There are two main phases in the endometrial cycle, the proliferative phase and the secretory phase. The proliferative phase is the first half of the menstrual cycle. During this, the main feature of the endometrial tissue is active proliferation and angiogenesis to ensure nutrition for the for the developing new tissue while suppressing apoptot apoptotic factors. The, the key player of this proliferative phase is estrogen. This estrogen induces proliferation of cells, stimulates expression of steroid receptors, and acts as a cell survival factor inhibiting apoptotic genes. In the secretory phase, during this phase, morphological changes that characterize the C dualization are taking place independently of if there's conception or not. This phase takes place from the 14th to 28th day of the natural cycle. Progesterone, which suppresses proliferation and induces cell differentiation, is the major player during this second half of the menstrual cycle. The endometrium is infiltrated by immune cells and is prepared then for the implantation of the blastocyst. At this stage, the outer shell of the womb and the pellucid zone break down and the embryo attaches to the wall of the uterus and grows there. This acceptance of the embryo is called endometrial receptivity, and the time period in which the uterus accepts the embryo is called window of implantation. We, we can then define window of implantation as the time period when, endometrium, when the endometrium is receptive for the embryo every month. Then both actors, embryo and endometrium, must interact with each other in order to achieve implantation that continues until a live birth. I will explain in the next minutes how is human implantation. In a natural conception, sperm and oocyte must find each other in the fallopian tube where the conception should occur and then the embryo generated travels during three or four days along the tube to the uterus. The embryo should achieve to the endometrial cavity at its stage of blastocyst, and then starts the chemical process of implantation. There are many genes and many molecules involved in this complex event. We start with the hatching of the embryo, which 
with help of some adhesion molecules, starts the apposition phase. After this, with collaboration of pinopodes, produces adhesion, and finally, if the embryo finds a receptive endometrium, produces invasion of the endometrial wall. The role of embryo in this attachment may be the most important fact in implantation rate. As we already know that if you have the potential of transferring three euploid blastocysts of high quality, you reach an accumulative rate of success of 95%. Of course, the endometrium is very important as well. And the task, and his task is double, as we said before, must be receptive and must be selective. We have been studying for many years the, the characteristics of the embryo, and we have them classified by quality. We know that blastocyte is the best embryo to transfer in uterus, and we even perform genetic testing in order, in order to transfer only euploid embryos, improving our success rates and decreasing in that way the risk of a miscarriage. We even use time-lapse system also as a way of knowing much more about our embryos development, not only in the morphology, but also about its kinetics. With these new incubators, we also improve the rate of embryos achieving the state of blastocyst. Under all these circumstances, as I said before, we could arrive to a 95% of success rate. But if we want to um, make highest rates, we should nowadays be studying the endometrium, which is the other main actor of implantation. We have many ways of studying the endometrium. Fortunately, the endometrium is one of the most accessible of all tissues and can be monitor monitored by biopsy, ultrasound, MRI to understand its status. Endometrial assessment is essential in different moments of a woman's life. First periods, reproductive age, peri- and postmenopausal bleedings. <clears throat> I am going to explain some of the assessment methods and its implications in fertility. Assessment of the endometrium as part of infertility workshop remains a very active area for research nowadays. It has, okay. it has been reported that endometrial integrins expression can predict not only endometriosis, but also success as part of IVF. Lots of integrins appear to be associated with overexpression of endometrial aromatase that has also been associated with poor IVF outcomes. The blockade of this aromatase improves IVF success, suggesting the primary importance of this aberrant expression of aromatase. Interestingly, endometrial biopsy prior to IVF has been shown by systematic review to be beneficial for implantation, suggesting that the endometrial injury sustained during biopsy, activates the, activates the endometrium and restores its function. About methods of assessment of endometrium, you are going to talk first of all about hist histological methods. Historically, much of the basis for endometrial assessment originated in the 1940s and 50s, when endometrial dating was established based on histological characteristics. The fact that the endometrium develops in a cyclic and organized way provided a roadmap to what it is considered normal development. Jones described the luteal phase defect in 1949 based on endometrial biopsies carried in different moments of the cycle. This is still nowadays a, an issue of debate and considered controversial after 60 years. Techniques to improve, um, to improve on histological dating criteria have been evolved, including the use of progesterone in blood, a surrogate market, the use of endometrial addition molecules to date the window of, of implantation, and most recently, DNA microarrays that examines the entire genome to dissect and divide endometrial development each month into its four stages, proliferative, 
early secretory, mid secretory, and late secretory. We advance in the study in endometrium, and we have uh, less invasive methods for endometrial assessment. For example, the most important is the transvaginal sonography that has become widely accepted as a tool for high resolution imaging of the uterus and endometrium. Growth of the endometrium can be easily measured using ultrasound. The endometrial thickness and texture can be indicators of normal development or be used as a sign of disease. In the early proliferative phase, immediately following menses, it is typically thin. It, in response to estrogen, the endometrium thickens and becomes thicker in appearance, growing between 0.1 and 0.5 millimeters daily. Following ov ovulation, the endometrium becomes hyper echoic and secretory changes ensue. Transvaginal, here we see in the first in the first image, we can see a trilaminar endometrium, typically from the from the proliferative phase. In the second, we can see a polyp clearly, which is a pathology of the endometrium, and we should remove it prior to an IVF treatment. We can see some three-dimensional images reconstructing endometrial cavity, very nice. We can see here a septate uterus, and we can see Doppler image, which we will talk about now. Transvaginal pulse Doppler ultrasound measures uterine artery blood flow expressed as the pulsatility index. The pulsatility varies along the cycle and may be used to predict implantation after uh, assisted reproduction technique. Aside from endometrial thickness and morphology, blood flow and uterine artery pulsatility have all been examined as possible markers of a receptive endometrium and increased pulsatility has been associated, associated with elevated markers of pregnancy loss, such as anticardiolipin antibodies. An interesting future area of research will be the correlation between pulsatility index and other ultrasound characteristics with traditional and advanced assessment of endometrial biomarkers. We have recently incorporated three-dimensional ultrasound to our daily practice in fertility. It is used to get a better assessment of uterine cavity, shape of the uterus, and volume measures of both endometrium and follicles. Next technique I'm going to speak about is sonohysterography. It consists of an infusion of a small amount of saline solution into the uterine cavity in order to be able to assess more accurately some pathologies of the endometrium. We use it also with a special fluid to study fallopian tubes. Here we can see uh, very clearly some polyps of the endometrium. We can see a clean cavity here. We can see how you can define the polyps with three dimension sonohysterography. So it's a very useful technique in some, in some cases. We can see here some magnetic resonance imaging of the uterus. Well, nowadays with the quality of our ultrasound, we don't usually need the magnetic resonance, but it provides a clear view of the uterine anatomy that is especially useful in the evaluation of tumors. MRI demonstrates the endometrial myometrial interface, so it can be used uh, to assess and myometrial invasion by endometrial carcinoma. And we use it sometimes to um, get more information about our myomas. The, the, the next technique is hysteroscopy. I know, I suppose you will have heard about hysteroscopy. It's an endoscopic technique that allows the study and treatment of the pathologies of the uterine cavity. We can use it just to see the endometrial cavity, to remove, to remove polyps, myoma, septum, or just to take a specific endometrial samples. Here we can see how we perform the hysteroscopy. We can see a normal cavity here with the, with the ostium. We can see a septate uterus here. We should remove the septum before transferring embryos. We can see a huge polyp. Uh, making most of the cavity here and some pathologies. 
And it is now considered the gold standard technique to study the endometrial cavity. And we perform it as part of the study of implantation failure. Depending on the purpose, we can perform diagnostic hysteroscopy, which is done in consultation without any kind of anesthetics, or surgical hysteroscopy in surgery room to remove myomas, polyps, or making any, any endometrial surgery. I will also speak about the ERA, Emma, and Alice tests, which are some uh, genetic molecular tests to study endometrium. The endometrial receptivity analysis, ERA, is a molecular based test designed to date the window of implantation in every single woman. To achieve this accuracy, the ERA requires an endometrial biopsy on day seven in a natural cycle or five of progesterone in a hormone replacement cycle. And it shows uh, taking in account 248 genes expression if the endometrium is receptive in that moment. So we can uh, uh, talk about pre-receptive endometrium, receptive or post-receptive and allows us to make the embryo transfer exactly during the window of implantation of the woman. There is no histologic assessment of the sample as we are going to, to just study the, these genes about that, that sample. The main critics to this technique are that we perform it during the AMOC cycle previous to the transfer cycle, which may be different from the real one. And results are not consistent in all the medical studies. Uh, however, it may be helpful in some cases of implantation failure, and we may use it as part of our different strategies to help couples to conceive. Emma is a molecular test that studies microbiota of uterus and is also helpful in some cases. Alice is used to discard chronic endometritis, situation that could decrease our success rates. They are also, also carried out from an endometrial biopsy during the secretory phase of the cycle, in the cycle prior to the embryo transfer one. There are many other studies that in some occasions we carry out in order to investigate implantation failures, such as NK cells research, KIR, HLA, and many other molecular markers currently in a study. As you can see in the PowerPoint, even the NK cells, which is the most common one, has non-standardized assessment is very different from one study to another. And even we don't agree on the reference ranks. So we have to explain our patients that are not uh, real um, based on evidence, on medical evidence techniques. And we're still discussing how they really interfere and how we should measure or treat them. Finally, we will talk about Mm, ways of improving embryo implantation from the point of view of endometrial receptivity. I would like to, to start this point explaining how sometimes we apply treatments to our patients not sufficiently based on scientific studies. All the techniques we use in clinic should have medical evidence of improving our results. If we do not carry out further investigation, we will be part of a race to nowhere. These are some of the treatments frequently used in order to improve our implantation rates. As we mentioned before, embryo quality and genetic euploidy are without any doubt the main factors in implantation. As we know, endometrium, because of its selectivity, mostly of the times, is not allowing to implant an euploid embryos. There are no not uh, important difference be differences between natural or hormone replace cycles for embryo transfer in regular cycle women. About the scratch, we can say that it's one of the methods that has showed 
uh, improvement in implantation rates in cases of implantation failure. And it's simple, cheap, it's a simple and cheap procedure that we carry out frequently in our daily pr practice. Eparin and low, low dose aspirin are medications we use in some patients trying to improve arterial flow in the uterus and especially indicated when thrombophilic factors are present. Eparin is also of common use because prevents some uh, uh, problems of, of blood clots in women. So as we are using sometimes uh, estrogens in high doses, we, we use to, to, to apply them also. Steroids, intralipids, gamma globulins, are used trying to modulate immune factors that could be taking part in implantation process, such as integrins, NK cells, etc. There are many other techniques. I mentioned acupuncture, we vitamins, probiotics, and many things. But what is a good practice, and we are all nowadays trying to perform, is an individualized uh, treatment from the beginning and a personalized embryo transfer adapting our protocols to the characteristics of a concrete patient, attending to her special circumstances, trying to get the best pregnancy rate possible in each totally different person. Uh, that's, thank you all for your attention and I will be very happy <clears throat> to answer your questions or concerns about this subject. Thank you so much indeed, Francisco, for bringing the, all those details, explaining how it works, what to do. And yes, now it is your favorite part, part everyone. You can now uh, type all of your questions. Uh, there is one question ready. So, um, okay, there is. Okay, thank you so much for now. But there is one question. So let's get to the first question that we've got. And what does it depend on if someone has a triple lining in the cycle or doesn't have it? Does it mean the endometrial is receptive? Well, about this question, about the triple lining, uh, the, in, in the proliferative phase, we said before, the first endometrial phase of the cycle, the endometrium is very thin at the beginning of the cycle and usually gets thick under the estrogen effect. And... In most of the patients, the endometrium is, is, shows a triple lining. And that means that the endometrium is getting thicker. And that means that it's under the, 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 under the fact of the estrogen activity. And <clears throat> we used to think that it's unreceptive endometrium. As we have said before, it doesn't always mean that, but it's the endometrium we like the most to make our transfers before before adding progesterone. Okay, thank you, Mel, for your very first question. Indeed, and of course, Dr. Anaya, thank you for explaining, and I do believe it has been helpful for you, Mel. And let's have a look, and we have another question. Would you consider T-shaped uterus as a factor for recurrent replantation failures? Yeah, this is a very difficult question. Uh, we are always discussing <clears throat> about T-shaped uterus. I, I am very involved with the, about this because I like, I'm, I used to make the surgery at my clinic, so, so we are very, very, very involved with this, with this subject. And <clears throat> yes, in some cases, T-shaped uterus, we consider it a, a cause of, of implantation failure, but to consider it, I think that for considering it the main factor, we should, first of all, have transferred some euploid and um, good quality blastocyst. As many times, we're uh, thinking of problems with endometrium, problems with the uterus, and what finally we find is that we have not had good quality uh, and genetic tested embryos. If we have an implantation failure in a T-shaped uterus, after transferring good, healthy embryos, we used to correct it. <clears throat> by hysteroscopy. 
Understood, of course. Thanks so much for your question and, of course, for your help here. And there's another one from the very same patient. So let's have a look. With MTF RH mutation and no other blood issues, would you suggest Clexane 20 milligrams per day or 40? Thanks, I'm 35. Well, with, with that mutation, we consider uh, Clexane. Yeah, we do it. Uh, about the we do it, and it's almost it's also a, a discussion thing because sometimes our team of hematology is not very does not agree with the heterozygote cases, but we used to add it because we try in, to avoid implantation failure and to avoid miscarriages, and uh, and we think that it avoids it. About the doses. It depends on the weight. It, it should be a milligram per kilogram. But we most, most of the times we use 40 milligrams as a standard dose. We never use we never use 20 milligrams, almost never. All right, understood. Yeah. First, thanks so I see your weight and your height, and we would use maybe 40 milligrams would be enough. Okay. Case. Thank you so much, of course, for the follow-up and answering that yeah, one as we, well. We would use 40 milligrams. Okay. Though your, do your standard doses in the books should be 60, but we would use 40. Th we think it's enough. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the clarification then, of course, and your follow-up here as well. Okay, more questions are coming up. Would you recommend doing a repeat ERA test after an ectopic pregnancy? If you have have if you ha have had just one ectopic pregnancy, I would not recommend doing a, a an ERA test. Uh, the ectopic pregnancy is not only about uh, endometrial receptivity, but about uh, migration of the embryo and sometimes about uh, problems with the mobility of the tubes. So. I don't think the erratic is the solution for, for one of ectopic pregnancy. Thank you for the explanation in such case, of course. Mel, thank you for your question as well. Um, let's have a look. Another question. In relation to intralipid, how many transfusions would you suggest? We suggest to do three infusions of intralipids. We used to make the first one uh, before the transfer. The second one in the, the, in the, the day of the transfer or, or the day after. And the third one, no, uh, sorry, I, I, I made a mistake. The first one is the around the transfer day. The second one is the with the, with the test, with the, with the positive test. And the third one is the 12th week of pregnancy. That's, that's our protocol. Yeah. Hi, can you hear me now? Hi, can you hear me? Please let me know. Yeah, I can okay. hear you. Sorry, I wasn't able to get back on, but everything is fine. Sorry about this, but I'm here, of course. And well, as you can see, there's a thanks from the patient right here. And there is another hello, great explanation. Thanks. And i um, waiting for some more questions. At least at this point, I don't see more. But of course, if you have any, yes, someone is typing. So let's give it a second. Let's wait for uh, okay. either a question or a thank you. Uh, don't miss your chance, right? So let's have a look. Yeah, there's another question from our patient. I had a negative uh, endoculture. Should I assume that my Emma should be okay? Well, it's not exactly the same. An endoculture is uh, a common culture to see some, to see that there's no infection about the endometrium. And the Emma is studying a molecular, molecularly the, the endometrium. So we shouldn't assume that. We, it's, they, are, they are different ways of studying the endometrium. Yeah. 
the MMA biopsy, the same as, as Alice biopsy, are performed in the second half of the menstrual cycle, maybe around the day 18, 20, 24, more or less. In fact, we used to perform all three together, Ira, Emma, and Alice in the same day. Just with one biopsy, we can we can do three, the three of them. Thank you again for your question and of course uh, for your help and explanation. And again, we need to wait a bit. Someone is typing, so uh, let's have a look whether we have another question. Um, may take a minute, but let's make sure that we will answer all the questions, of course, right? So, okay. <laughs> sometimes just need to, uh, we need more time. Uh, yeah, there is another question from Angela this time. When would you not advise doing the ERA Emma Alice tests? Okay. In fact, we we do not advise to do them usually. Just we say we um, we advise to do them in very special occasions. They are part of our study of implantation failure, which we nowadays are considering after two or three embryos, euploid of good quality blastocyst transferred. So. We do not perform them in a in a normal patient. In fact, the last study I've been I've been reading uh, a summary of studies uh, showed that after ERA test, it just uh, when the endometrium was receptive, uh, the rate of implantation was fifty percent. And when the endometrium was pre-receptive or post-receptive, using the ERA um, dates, just we they achieved a thirty-three percent of implantation, and those are similar rates to to a patient without any of these tests. So it's not so clear the use of them. So we we of course use them, but in special occasions. Thanks so much for the clarification as well. And um, that might be our final question, but of course, if you have any more, you know what to do and let's have a look. Um, so how long is the result of the individual receptivity map valid for how many cycles after the test has been done? That's a perfect question because I ask that, that question also for me. We don't really know how how long is. In fact, we our doubts, our concerns about these tests are that we sometimes we have doubts if it's the same the, the cycle we performed in than the next cycle in which we are transferring the embryo. So we have many doubts about about this. The if some studies say that you should they are valid for four months, maybe four to six months, but uh, I, I wouldn't say that. I that's the main critic to all these techniques that, that are not made in the same cycle that we are transferring the embryo. So we're not sure about this. Understood, of course. Thanks for the question, and thank you, of course, for that uh, advice and answer. Um, yeah, sometimes it's just not uh, clear enough, I'm afraid, but there's nothing we can do about it, right? Um, okay, two more questions are right here, so let's have a look. Uh, I was found uh, with high NK, UNK cells, 61% range 28, 49. Would you prescribe steroids? Yes, we would prescribe steroids. And uh, depending on your medical history, maybe we would, we would think of, of making in chalipids infusion also. All right, thanks so much, of course, uh, again, for the clarification. And this is next question. Would subserosal fibers affect implantation or miscarriages? I had rather large ones, seven, seven, 10 centimeters, but look tiny on ultrasound, one, three, four. <laughs> Sorry, I, I don't really understand this. So the myomas are seven, seven and 10 centimeters? 
large? Uh, I think so, yes. Yeah. Well, uh, yes. With, with subs when, when you have uh, subserosal fibroids, usually they don't affect much about the endometrial cavity, but these sizes are very, very big. Two myomas of seven centimeters and one of 10 centimeters. Uh, I think we we would advise to remove them if, prior to, a, to an embryo transfer. Yeah. We would make surgery before transferring because they are too big to maybe to uh, maybe it's it's possible to try one embryo transfer but if you've gone into a, a an implantation failure or into a miscarriage uh, we would advise surgery of these myomas they are too too big sorry that was the um the additional um yeah, clarification, sorry. Uh, okay, and Angela has added something, so let me just go here. Even after the removal, I never got pregnant, scared, or did it, or did it implant? Yeah, that's what I, I was saying before. Sometimes we focus our problems in the uterus, in the endometrium, and I don't know about the embryos, if they were genetic tested, if about the age, about the quality of the embryos, if they were blastocysts. Uh, these are the main things for, in my opinion, the main facts that are influencing the, the rates of pregnancy. Of course, it's better not to have myomas, of course, but uh, maybe we should uh, take a look at all your history and, and decide what is affecting the implantation. Okay, thank you for yet another explanation, of course. And let's go back to the previous patient. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry, Angela has added one more, so let's finish uh, this um, as well. And with new cycles and hormones, they are again, had them removed twice, even with donor eggs and good sperm, not even a pregnancy, but donor has children and successful uh, donations. Yes, uh, I understand you, you uh, Angela. I understand. May you have maybe you have a very difficult uterus, and it's not easy to to get a, a pregnancy sometimes. Even removing the the myomas, because when we remove the myomas, the uterus is still not a normal uterus. So sometimes it affects implantation. Maybe it is what is affecting you. I. I I'm not sure about it. Uh, as I said before, uh, with donor eggs and good sperm, if they are genetic tested, the embryos, they should implant. But even with donor eggs and good sperm, uh, we, we should see if the sperm has the fish test done or genetic tested. If they, then, then it is an implantation failure and we should consider every reason, maybe the uterus, yes. Again, thank you so much, of course, for explaining uh, again <laughs> here. Um, let's have a look. Okay, one more from uh, B. Would you suggest assuming omega-3 during a frozen yeah. cycle? Yeah, of course. Omega-3 is never going to harm. Okay. This is helping, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm asking simply because uh, there is a follow-up. I was suggested to stop it when starting clexane. Does this make sense? Well... Not in the beginning. It has nothing to see one with the other. You can take omega-3 and, and click the same. It's, it's different ways of, of treating different things. I don't think they are related. That was helpful for you, me as well. Um, and thank you so much. Uh, I think that we might be finishing as I do not see more questions. However, um, as I always say, you know, remember that you can get in touch with Dr. Naya and his team at Vista Hermosa, and I'm more than sure that they will be able to help you out even with more details, because, of course, um, I'm sure that all the doctors need some more details in order to properly answer. They need the whole medical history, as always, right, to, to be able to give um, proper advice as well. Um, and we will be finishing for tonight's. There is someone typing, but I think it's, yeah, it's a thank you already, so... 
let me show you this one, sorry. Um, thank you for the information presentation, of course. Thank you so much indeed. Um, Dr. Rosisko, thank you so much for joining us tonight, for explaining all those details, explaining how it works, and of course, answering all the questions. It's been a great session, and I'm glad that you've been able to join us. It's your first day of vacation, so I'm even more um, yeah. happy that you are still able to come here and help us a bit. Uh, so thanks a lot indeed. And everyone, as always, thanks so much. It's always wonderful to see you back here and asking questions. And yes, exactly. Have a great summer, as you can see from the patient as well. Thank you very much. <laughs> so Thank yeah, you. we all need that every now and then, right? So, um, okay. and as you know, this is our final uh, webinar before summer break. So don't worry, we'll be back, but in September. So again, I would like to tell you, uh, have us great, great summer. And of course, best of luck if you are going for treatment this August and best of luck. We are always uh, hoping to hear some good news. So we will be waiting for some good news. Okay. And of course, thank you so much. It's always great to be here every single day, supporting you, answering your questions, helping out. So I do hope to see you back here in September. There are more and more events coming up. Also with um, with Vista Hermosa, possibly Dr. Francisco will be back with us as well. So I'm already looking forward to it. It's for sure. been a pleasure whenever you want. Okay. <laughs> okay, that's good to hear. Thanks so much indeed. And remember, it has been recorded and you will be able to find this uh, webinar on myabbyfancis.com. It will be available on YouTube channel and as you know, there are over 380 webinars available. So, you know, even though we will not be live tomorrow or the next day, you will be able to find lots and lots of um, topics right there as well. Thanks so much. Take care. And uh, I will see you back here in September. Okay. Thanks so much. Bye. Thank you, Caroline. Bye. Bye. Bye.